Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Categorically Romance podcast. My name is Bree, and I mean, my personal rock star is here yet again, author Jill Chalvis. Jill, thank you for being here again today. <laughs> yes, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Okay, first off, before I get all sappy, because I have a lot of things to tell you about this book, <laughs> how has 2023 started for you so far? I mean, I can't believe it's June, and we did have the eight-month winter from hell, but so far, it's okay other than that. <laughs> I feel like I say this every time we talk, but listeners, if you're not following Jill on Instagram, you need to be. Like, the picture that you posted, it was like this hard mountain of snow. <laughs> yes. It's like, and what that was is my okay? street. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's starting in October and the la- it just melted. It just, and we still have patches in our woods. It's been crazy. Wow. Crazy. So there's still like writing. these random patches of snow. <laughs> oh, yes. And my poor dog, she runs from patch to patch to pee. I don't know what she's going to do when it's all gone. I don't know. <laughs> Let her live her best life, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Well, congratulations on the release of the Sweetheart List. And like I said, I I have some sappy thoughts. But before I get into that, will you just quickly share with everyone what it's about? Yes. So it's about a woman who uh, decides at age age 30-ish that her life is not fulfilling and she's unhappy. So she decides to go back to the last place she was happy and start over. And that just happens to be when she was 12, her and her mom spent a summer in Lake Tahoe. And so that's what she does. She packs a car up, loads up her dog, and they drive 600 miles away from everything she knows and starts over in Lake Tahoe. I was standing in the kitchen and I'm like, <laughs> I was like, the, your books, because we get a summer release and then you always give us a release like at the very beginning of the year. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, like they're always right on time. Like this book. I didn't know I needed it as much as I needed it. Like (laughs) the beginning of 2023, it has been rough for me. And it's like, I'm like subconsciously telling myself, Jill knew I needed a new book. (laughs) Well, I'm sorry it's been rough for you. I hate that for you. But I am so happy the book helped even a little tiny bit. That'd be awesome. And so I was like trying to like analyze myself. I'm like, what is it? (laughs) Like, I think with this book in particular, I mean, and and this is something that I get with all of your books, but but this one specifically, because it's the latest one, I just, I felt like, because I'm one of those readers that like, I think there's two readers, like you either pretend you're the main character or you're friends Mm -hmm. with the main character. And so I kind of felt like I was Harper. And so I felt like I was being welcomed and welcomed into the family. (laughs) Here's the thing about the sweetheart list. I think that if you've ever been unhappy in your life, even for a moment, and frankly, most of us after the last few years have been unhappy more than a moment, this book is the fantasy. She literally drives away from her life and starts over. Yeah. (laughs) And who hasn't fantasized about About doing that? that? Yes. So like, I mean, that's what it really did for me. I was like, I, I felt like I was Harper. I felt like I was Ivy and I was welcomed into like, I have this wonderful, you know, new, new love story, but also like these wonderful brothers, this wonderful, caring mom with Susie. I was like, I feel like, I felt like <laughs> that's what it was for me. What, what is, what does it do for you? Like writing it, what did it do for you? Well, a couple of things I'll speak to that about. First of all, this was one of the hardest books I've ever written. And I'm not sure why, because the premise came so easy to me, but it felt so important to me to tell Harper's and Ivy's story. But then Bodhi walked onto the page and I fell in love with him. And so then I had to create a whole story for him as well. So, and he just wouldn't go away. He, he was the sexiest, most fun hero I've written in a long time. And the fact about that is he's truly broken. He doesn't Mm -hmm. think he's worthy of love, but I still fell completely in love with him. So I ended up having to tell three stories, which I didn't intend to do. So there's that. But also Ivy spoke to me. She's a teenager, a runaway teenager. And I had an unhappy childhood, rough childhood. And I think the fantasy for me growing up was this can't be my life. Like there's surely I belong somewhere else. So, so Ivy kind of wrote herself for me too. 
Oh my gosh, that clears up so much. Because <laughs> I was thinking, I was like, did Bodhi come to her first? Like he just felt, it felt no. like everything started with Bodhi. <laughs> I know, right? So this is the problem. Once I, it was like a third of the way through the book before I realized how important he was going to be to me. So I had to go back and kind of redo the beginning because he deserved to be on the page from the get-go. And so that's what happened. It took me forever to write it, but I think it turned out okay in the end, thankfully. So it really started with like Harper and Ivy? Yes. It really started with just Harper. I actually didn't even know about Ivy. It started with just Harper driving into this new place. And, you know, there's a bookstore on one side where she meets her, starts out as kind of her frenemy and turns out to be a, a much more to her than that. And I thought it was going to be the story of those two, like a sisterhood, but I can never, ever resist a bromance. So when I realized that Brody had brothers, it was over, game over, because then I had to tell that story. (laughs) Well, we're we're going to talk about the meet cute because I have to talk about that. But first, so I, again, I was like analyzing myself and my love of your books. (laughs) And I'm like, and this is kind of where like this Venn diagram came in. So, so I was like thinking back, I was like, okay, all the books that I love, all like all like just thinking of the character, like the heroines, your heroines, you have a lot of like bust their ass, hardworking heroines. So I was thinking of like natural blonde instinct. We had Kenna who like worked all these jobs, but, but like wanted to prove she deserved to be in this company. Um, I thought of roughing it with Ryan, which I read for the first time a couple of months ago. Suzanne's a cook and like she was hardworking. And then in this one, we get Harper. And the what made me think about this is like when I was reading it, um, Harper was talking with Ivy and they were talking about Harper going to college. And she's like, I lived in her, she lived in her car for a month. She nannied, worked at a deli, living off of peanut butter and ramen. And I'm like, this is why Jill's characters are so relatable because so many of us, (laughs) you know, if you haven't had that experience in particular, you know what it's like to just be living off of cup of noodles and working these these random jobs. Uh, So like, what is it about That was real for me. (laughs) <laughs> I think the thing is, is that I had a humble beginning. Um, if I wanted to go to college and I did, I ate apples and peanut butter and ramen. That's how I got through. And I just love when the main characters have been through it in the past, because frankly, if you're writing a contemporary romance and you need conflict, which you do, you can't get it from a bad guy with a gun. You can't get it from a zombie apocalypse. Like you have to dig deep to the characters And so that's one way for me to be able to create conflict is to have these people have had a rough start or been through it or to have some trauma. I don't know how else to make a good conflict in contemporary romances. I was like, that's it. Like all of your heroines that I've read so far, like they've all been these women who have had to bust their ass. Like nothing was handed to them. And I love that so much. But you know what? We don't want to read about a heroine who's never had a problem in her life. Right. And I just think it's more realistic at the end to make a strong heroine and a strong heroine can take care of herself. A strong heroine doesn't need no stinking man. However, wanting one is different and that's okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. So when we meet Harper, and this is, an, uh, this is another thing that I was like, it's going to feel a little woo woo, but I have to go there. I was like, in today's world, right, we have all these influencers that are like preaching bullet lists and create lists for this and all of that. And Harper is done with lists. So <laughs> where did that come from? Because I can't make a list and keep it to save my life. I even a shopping list, I just I'll make it and then I leave it at home or I can't organize it. I'm not all that organized. So lists are painful for me. I'm ADHD and unmedicated and it just hurts my soul. And I have tried to make bullet lists, to keep a journal. I cannot do it. So for once I wanted to write a heroine who just failed at this new thing that everyone else is succeeding at. She has failed and she said no more. And then as the story goes on, she keeps thinking, well, if I'd had a list, maybe I would remember to do this, but I don't have a list. And she just has to live with this choice. And see, this is why I feel like I'm a Joel Shalva's heroine, because I was thinking back to almost just friends and our heroine in that book 
loved yes, writing in her planner right. and making lists. And I was like, that was me at the time. And now I'm so, so much like Harper. I'm like, I'll just jot down what I did today, but I'm not making a list. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. I forgot about almost just friends. And in fact, I, if I remember correctly in that book, she ends up with her bullet list journal in the lake, in the lake, <laughs> in the lake. <laughs> So it didn't do her any good either. <laughs> it didn't do her any good. Yes. Um, the opening scene, you touched on a little bit, but like we have to go there because it's one of my favorite opening scenes ever. So you said Harper like, you know, drives into town. She more like skids into town. Yes, <laughs> and well, that's where all, she meets she Bodhi. Know. That's right. She didn't know that in Tahoe, she's an LA girl. So she didn't know that it could snow in July in Tahoe. And it does. And she literally skids into town <laughs> and, <laughs> and so hits like, a manzanita bush. <laughs> and Bodhi pops out and he wants to help her. She refuses her, he refuses his help because she's like, I, I, he, okay, this is where the, the nicknames come in. She calls him nice ass. He calls her Mrs. I got this. She refuses his help. <laughs> but then she also meets Shay. And I'm like, that when I finished the book, I was like, wow, that scene was so important because like these two very important people at the end of the book, she meets them like right off the bat together. But when she meets Shay, she's actually Velma from Scooby-Doo, <laughs> which I loved. <laughs> and you were like, well, the book's like, she's like, well, why are you dressed like this? And she's like, it's um, at the bookstore. It's um, like great female detectives. And I was like, why don't we think of Velma as a great female detective she is she I was <laughs> so like how can you talk about writing that scene and like getting them all three on page together well, this is what this is what I mean like Bodhi didn't even wasn't even a factor for me in original chapter one she pull Harper pulls into town as crashes into this manzanita bush and then Shay comes out of her bookstore dressed as Thelma and they start a, a friendship because I needed her you can't uh, I don't like when my heroine is an island of one, like she needs to have a sounding partner. So I needed her to have somebody, she didn't know anybody in town. So I wanted her to meet Shay from night one. Turns out that they're not immediate friends. Like, you know, there's some suspicion there on both parts. But then as I started to write this book and I realized how important Bodhi was going to be, I, I understood he had to be in that scene. So I went back and changed the scene so he could be there. Yeah. Just because him and Shay have a relationship, not a love story, but they are friends. Um, Shay has a relationship with Bodhi's brother, which oh, is nice. on and off. <laughs> yeah. So I really enjoyed all the threads that tied these few core characters together. Yeah. And you, so I was like, I pulled the book back out and I'm like, how many pages is this book? Cause like I flew, like I started it. And then I got busy for a couple of days. So then I had a hair appointment and I restarted it. <laughs> and I feel like within like a couple of hours, I was 200 pages into the book and I'm like, so much has happened. And then I finished the book and I'm like, I was so invested in so many things. This book, could I, I don't know how it's not like 400, 500 pages. And I'm like, Jill's so good. Like I was so invested in what happened with Shay and Mace and they're not even like the main romance, but you had them, you had Ivy, you had the romance between Harper and Bodie. Like how do you do all that? And then the big that? secret. And, and then, then the big, the big secret. secret. And then Jesse and that. James with <clears throat> Ivy. Like how do you do all of that in 346 pages? Well, I tend to write short. Uh, I don't, I don't have a lot of excess in that book in particular because I just, I like to write short. I like it to be short and fast. I don't, I don't like to slow the pacing down. And I knew I had all these different threads. So in this book, the most important thing I did was plot it ahead of time, down to the very every single scene. It took me almost as long to outline the book as it did to write the book. But that's the only way you can do it with this many stories involved and keeping the love story front and center for for the romance writer readers. So it, it was all about the plotting. Okay. And then, so Bodhi wasn't even a factor at first. Ivy kind of was there. How did the whole, I don't want to spoil it, but like this book has a really fun twist on like surprise baby. How did mm -hmm. you, how did you plot that into it? I really had to do a lot of math and math is not my strong point. <laughs> it took Same. a lot of math <laughs> to figure out like how old was everybody going to be and how could I work this while keeping Bodhi and Harper, or at least Bodhi 
very young, I mean, relatively young, early thirties. So it was not, that was not easy. And, but it was important to me that I told you in the very beginning of this talk that I had to create a story for Bodhi because he was very important. It mm-hmm. became very important. So that's where Ivy came in. Okay. Was in, in, in developing a story for Bodhi, I realized what he was, what he was missing in his life. I loved having a teenager, a teenager's point of view of everything. And she's like tough and she's so much like Harper in a, in a lot of ways. Like you, you can just tell that they identified with, with each other a lot. And I loved how Harper kind of handled her. Like, if you don't want to talk about it, it's fine. You know, <laughs> like she, <laughs> she got it. Um, and I just loved her her toughness and she comes out there for one thing and she's kind of like hanging out at the bar. Um, and then she kind of sees like, man, this family really loves each other. They like argue and play a lot. And she was just so fun. And then you introduce the Jesse and James characters. What did you Mm -hmm. want Ivy to learn or experience from that situation? Cause I did not see things going the way that they did with that situation. But then when it did, I was like, oh man, that makes so much sense. I really wanted Ivy. You can't have a runaway teenager be um, a saint because, Mm -hmm. you know, she's had to do things to survive and whatever, but I knew she was a good kid at heart. And the only way to show Ivy that she was a good kid at heart, because she didn't necessarily believe that about herself, given her background was to show her, with other teens who maybe don't have the same kind of heart she did. So I started off that way. So she meets these twins, Jesse and James, and they're not what they appear. And then you think they're one thing and then they turn out to be another thing and then another thing still. And I just really enjoyed doing that kind of flipping the script. Well, I, again, back to like my little Venn diagram of heroines, (laughs) I was like, Shay reminds me of something. So I had to, Immediately, I was like, she reminds me of Elle from Accidentally oh, on Purpose. Yes. <laughs> One of my favorites, One actually. One of my favorites, right. So, I mean, did that ever occur? Did it ever, when you no. were writing her, did, were you like, this feels familiar? I, I think that's what it was. I was like, she just feels familiar. Like, Elle was so tough. Like, you don't mess with Elle. And, and so bossy. I was reading that and, and bossy, right? And I was like, this, this feel, I thought it was, I was like, is Shay Elle's long lost cousin? And this is a <laughs> I had actually forgotten all about Shay. I mean, Elle and Art. what was it? Archer? Mm-hmm, Something. Mm-hmm. I, that's, I wrote that many years ago. Um, that, what did we say it was called? I can't even remember the title Acc- of that Accidentally one. Accidentally on purpose. It's hard yes, to remember because Elle's so tough and it has this like cute pink cover. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. Uh, I did not notice that Shay had shades of L, but I do love that kind of a character as a secondary character, a secondary heroine, because she can really tell it like it is. So sometimes she can say things that, for instance, Shay was able to say things that maybe Harper hadn't thought of herself or wasn't ready to think yet. And I really like that. It makes the heroine think, it moves the story along without a lot of, you know, without too much telling. It was easier to show than tell. Did you have a favorite character in this book? For sure. And it's Bodhi. I don't know why. I love him. It was hard to move on from him. It took me a couple, it took me longer than it should have to be able to move on to the next book. He really is like, I think he's like the glue in the book. Like he... He is the glue. He's the glue for his family. He's the glue for Harper. He's certainly the glue for Ivy that she didn't know she was missing. And I just loved him. I loved how he interacted with his brothers. I loved his guilt. I loved how broken he thought he was. And then he turned out to not be as broke, quite as broken as he thought. I really enjoyed him. So when you have this story with such a, I mean, the big chunk of the big, I I feel like the big presence in the book is Ivy and Bodie, but you also Mm -hmm. have this like, undeniable romance between two people who obviously belong together how did you balance that it was it was actually in the plotting so I was able to say okay I want the romance to be at least 50 percent of the story Mm -hmm. so that left 25 percent of the story for Ivy's story and then another 25 percent that I used for Bodhi's and his brothers and Harper and Shay 
And so that was just a matter of ticking off the scenes and making sure I color code them so I can make sure that I'm, I have enough to equal 50% for the romance. I'm not cheating the romance in any way, but that the others are, the other stories are still getting their full circle story. I mean, it's not easy for me plotting. I, it's the hardest part. Did you have um, a favorite scene in the book? Well, I, I really enjoy the opening scene. Actually, I think it's the next morning scene where Harper gets up, looks out the window and sees a bear's butt sticking out her out car. Her car. She's, <laughs> she's left her skinny pop popcorn in the car. And again, if you don't live in Tahoe, you don't know. You can't leave food in your car. Even if you lock your car, the bear's going to get in. You, they can smell it for forever away. And so I was just having fun telling that scene. I thought it was hysterical that she also sees Bodhi out there chasing the bear away like it's nothing, you know. And that's when I knew, okay, Bodhi's going to be hot as hell <laughs> because he just was not afraid of anything except for maybe his feelings. He really wasn't afraid. I loved that about Bodhi. <laughs> he was not afraid of anything. I loved that scene. Uh, any any scene with um, Shay's abuela was hilarious. Oh, when- yes. <laughs> When she walked, because Harper would walk into the bookshop and the Adams family jingle would go off. (laughs) And you just think that that's the jingle, like when you open the door and then you finally give us the scene where her grandma's like, what did I tell you about changing it to this? And that's when you're like, oh, it's not supposed to be this. (laughs) Yeah, I I had a good, good time with the boy, like, because she was just also kind of like how I would imagine Shay is going to be when she's old. (laughs) kind of tough a little badass my heart went out for to Shay though because like you don't know for a while why her and mace broke up Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but she'll like go to the bar and just kind of hang out like you it's almost like she wants him to do something but she doesn't know what and you as a reader really don't know like for a while like what happened um Cause so like, why did you want to include that, that romance? And, and like, what did you want people to take away well, from it? I wasn't sure that Shay was going to get a romance. I thought her and Mace would be exes and they would just be the Bickersons throughout this book as fun. But then I realized they still love each other. <laughs> so I had to figure out what happened to break them up. That wasn't so unforgivable that they could get back together. Mm-hmm. I wanted that. And I'm, you know, how many times this does happen in real life where you fall in love with someone and it's just not the right time and then down the road. So I like it. I always love a second chance romance. So that's what Shay and Mace were to me. And then I loved Serena, (laughs) Serena and Zeke, Serena being the, I was like, I'm so glad they have a lawyer in the family. (laughs) Yes. So that's Bodhi's older brother and his wife. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, Bodhi, was Bodhi is so, he's just surrounded by love. Like Shay, regardless if she wants to admit it or not, her, Shay and Mace, Serena and Zeke. And then of course his mom, like they're just, mm-hmm. like I said, I felt like I was welcomed into the family. Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> I love a cast of thousands. I really do. Especially a family. If there's so much tur- turmoil in the front story, which there was, I needed the the surrounding background to be enough to give me good humor that that people believed it. So I thought a loving family that, you know, you can love someone and still want to smack them upside the back of the head, which was how Bodhi's family shows affection. And so that was easy for me to do, to put comedy in the back. I loved like the, um, the family text messages and like, you'll, you'd give us some where the mom would be included <laughs> and you'd give us some where it's just the brothers. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Sometimes you don't need mom on your text thread. Yeah, we don't we don't need mom in the text thread all the time. In the epilogue, the end of the book, there's a surprise. Like a surprise a is surprise. revealed. And I was like, why didn't I ever think of that? So like without I mean, giving away either. the surprise, did you? Okay, you didn't think of it either till the end? No, here's what happened. As we talked about earlier, I was short a word count and I didn't want anybody to feel gypped. And a lot of times... If I don't include an epilogue telling people, showing people like a year from now or six months from now to prove that they're still happy and together, readers aren't always satisfied. They need to know that this people are in it for the long haul. So I went back and wrote an epilogue trying to figure out how to show all that. That's a big ask of a three page epilogue, but I think it worked out okay. Yeah, it was great. It was fantastic. I was like, 
That makes so much sense. Why didn't I ever think of that? <laughs> I just needed to tie it all up, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, wh- what is, right, okay, I'm, I'm really big on like, what does the, this current moment feel like for you? I think it's the whole eras thing. What is your current yes. <laughs> writing era? Like, what do you feel, where do you feel like your writing era is right now? Like, what's your moment? I feel like it's, um, if we're talking theme, which is what the Ares tour kind mm-hmm. of is. I think the theme of my moment right now is found family. You're not always born into the family you want, but you know, you, you can find it. You can make it. It is what you make. It doesn't have to be blood. Yeah. Yeah. And, and do you feel like that's something you've grown in over time or, cause I feel like even when I go back to your older books, it's there. Well, that's funny. I, I, I don't think it was ever conscious. I mean, even now it wasn't until you just asked me that that's what I would say. I guess to me, it's always been important to have a, I guess you can go back to any of my books and say there's a sense of community in all of them, whether it's a big town or small town, most of them are small town, Mm -hmm. but like the Heartbreaker Bay series is set in San Francisco. That was big town. So I had to create a sense of community by using a common building that everyone either worked or lived in. So it is a sense of community, a sense of love, that happens that I feel is important to me in my books. Yeah. That's, that's how I feel. I'm like, I can just tell that it's important for Jill, for people to like, not feel alone. Cause Mm -hmm. in every book that I've read, like you mentioned Harper and why you felt she needed Shay. I'm like, this is, I get this feeling with all your books. Like your, your girl's going to have, she's going to have a friend. (laughs) If it's not an entire gang of people, she's going to meet a, a, a new BFF. I mean, when I read Roughing with Ryan, same thing. I was like, she wrote this a long time ago, some years ago. Like and like, decades we get a, ago, <laughs> we get a BFF within the first like chapter. <laughs> as soon as she I meets guess for her. me, love is love. And it, I'm not, it doesn't have to be romantic love. There are lots of different kinds of love. And, and so I like to show that in different forms. Yeah. And I just like, there are series of yours that I've bought and they're kind of like in this break in case of emergency. Like I like the feeling that I haven't read all of your books. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot. So I don't blame you. <laughs> Cause I just know that like, you know, at any time I'm like, okay, I have this three book series here that I can just pick up. And I, cause I need that feeling. And I, um, I saw on your website, the next book is called The Bright Spot. Yes. Is it too early to tell us no, anything about it? We can talk about it. This is one of my favorites. I can't wait for people to read it. I, it's still not finished all the way. Um, it also is going to be a sort of found family situation, mm-hmm. but it's about a young woman who is running um, a, an organic tree farm. So she's up here in Tahoe and she has like Christmas trees in the in the winter and she's got cherry trees and crab apple trees in the other seasons. And she's also a farm rescue, animal rescue. So running around this farm are all the the, the misfit animals that no one else wanted, like the blind duck and the orphaned baby cow. And so I just I just love this book. And then uh the hero in that book is is a rather different hero for me. He he he's called in um by the owner of the farm and he's the man he's like the financial wizard of and this farm is in trouble and so they're kind of at odds because they're, they're very very different he is a different shalvis hero for for sure he's a little uptight he numbers are the only things that make sense to him he sounds like else. a total suit <laughs> yes he's a suit and i don't do that very often but he has a lot to learn about heart and um forgiveness and just like opening up and she has a lot to learn in the way of like discipline and and organization and that sort of thing so I've had a lot of fun with these two who are at odds for much of the book but also have this undeniable chemistry that they can't seem to shake so I'm I'm really enjoying this one I'm so excited because I feel like I'm part of a club and I feel like (laughs) this hero I'm like you have to learn how to be in our Joel Shalvis club. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. You will. He will conform eventually. <laughs> I mean, we're not against suits here, but I mean, come no. on, guy. You got to, you have to relax a little. <laughs> we have fun over this. here. 
<laughs> he learns how to shed the soup very quickly, actually, because the first thing that happens is that the animals try to love up on him. <laughs> and that's very difficult. Farm animals are a little messy and they're a little, they, let's just say the suit doesn't survive. How did this, the idea for the story come to you? Was it the heroine? Was it the farm animals? Was it the suit? Almost every single book other than this one, I can tell you that the characters came to me first. But in this case, about a year ago, our family went to a farm not too far from here. And it, it was very similar to, I mean, I kind of emulated this farm. And I just fell in love with this idea of farm rescue. <laughs> like I hadn't seen that. I hadn't seen these adorable little piglets being best friends with baby goats because they were all they had. You know, I just felt that these baby animals had created a sense of community that reminded me of my books. You don't have to be like someone to love them. So that's what happened. This is the first time this has ever happened where the setting came to me first. Mm -hmm. Do you know how much longer, because look, I was really investigating for my own selfish reasons. I'm like, okay, Wildstone, we got this many books. Heartbreaker mm -hmm. Bay, we got this many. How long are we going to be staying in Sunrise Cove? Because I'm loving it here, but I know well, one thing a I, minute. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's been a hot minute. I will tell, I mean, for one thing, for readers who don't know and who are listening, these books all can be read alone within the Wildstone series and the Sunrise Cove series. They're connected only by setting. So I like that for readers because then they they see book eight. They don't have to worry about books one through seven unless they choose to want to go back and read them. So I will tell you that at least one more book past the bright spot okay. will be set in the Sunrise Cove series. And so that's, I kind of wanted to ask. So when you do these series like this one in Wildstone where they're not connected and you've said before, you've, you've chatted, you've, you've shared with me before, like we've talked Heartbreaker Bay and you're like, I could go mm -hmm. back to Heartbreaker Bay at any time. You don't really close yep. things out. But with these series that aren't connected, do you have a sense of like, I'm done here or no? With Wildstone, I felt I had explored the setting that that one's set in the mid California coast. So you have the wineries and the green rolling hills and the beaches. And I felt like I had explored all of that for the time being. And then I moved to Lake Tahoe, which is a no brainer for me because I live here. I am now on book eight and that might be it, but it won't ever always be it. Like mm -hmm. I will definitely go back to these other series. I still want to go back to Lucky Harbor. Oh my god! I have gosh. plenty of stories to tell. <laughs> I have plenty of stories to tell. And now I have a few things that have been optioned. So some of those series will definitely be getting more books. Do you know how much the world would freak out if all of a sudden we got a new Lucky Harbor book? Oh my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> I would love to do that. I would love to do that. I also had more stories to tell in the Cedar Ridge Cove series, which is only three. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, so there's plenty there to tell. There's more to tell at Heartbreaker Bay. There's more to tell anywhere, frankly. <laughs> From like a business aspect, is it, would it be easy to go to your publisher or whomever and say, Hey, I want to return back here. Cause I my readers would love is, it, but you know, I, I would love it too. And my editor is the best. She just wants me to write what I want to write and she's on board. So it's going to be okay. Whatever I decide to end up with her and I will talk it out. And I'm sure in the end, we'll be able to come up with the right story to do that. I just, I really should take a poll and say to readers, what, what series interests you the most for me to go back to? That'd be fun. Let's, that's what I need to do. I if your do editor that. listens to this, I love you, editor. <laughs> Please She's let her do whatever she wants. <laughs> <laughs> she does. She's great. Well, I can't wait for The Bright Spot. Um, thank you so much for giving us the sweetheart of list course. and Harper and, and Ivy. And I'm so happy that Bodie you know, annoyed you until you put them on the page. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I just hope other readers like it like you do. So oh, that'd be nice. Gosh, it was exactly what I needed. Well, I mean, share with everybody where they can keep up with you online. Instagram, Facebook, my website. I have a blog. Any, you can just search my name and come find me. I love it when readers come find me and chit chat. So please do. Well, listeners, as always, I will have links to where you can keep up with the Jill Chalvis. She'll be back. She has another book coming out. I have to read it <laughs> and we have to talk about it. 
We will talk. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me.